Good afternoon, Coach Slack here once again, continuing our readings on the ascetical homilies of St. Isaac the Syrian. I believe this is day 59 of our readings. Uh, we're continuing our way through homily 6. We're on page 174. It is an excellent thing to teach men that which is good, and by constant care to draw them away from delusion and into the knowledge of life. This is the path of Christ and the apostles, and it is very lofty. But if a man perceives in himself that through such a way of life and continual communion with men his conscience is weakened by seeing external things, his serenity is disturbed and his knowledge is darkened, since his mind must still be guarded and his senses must still be held in submission, and that while he seeks to heal others he loses his own health, and departing from the chast freedom of his will, his mind is shaken. Then let him remember the apostolic exhortation which says... Strong food belongeth to them that are more perfect. Let him turn back, lest he hear from the Lord the words of the proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Let him condemn himself. Let him watch over his own good health instead of audible words. Let his excellent manner of life serve for edification. And instead of the sounds of his mouth, let his works teach others. And when he keeps his soul healthy, let him profit others and heal them by his own good health. For when he is far from men, he can benefit them even more by the zeal of his good works than by his words, since he himself is sickly and is, is in greater need of healing than they. For if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Strong food belongs to those who are healthy, whose senses are exercised, who are able to take every kind of nourishment, that is, the invasion of all the senses, and by reason of their training and perfection, are able to endure every encounter without their heart being harmed. When the devil wishes to defile with recollections of fornication a mind that is resplendent with purity, he first tests its constancy by the love of vainglory. Since the inception of this thought has no appearance of passion, he constantly acts thus with men who guard their mind and in whom he cannot readily introduce an unseemly thought. But when a man departs from his fortress through converse with the first thought and moves away from his refuge, the devil immediately confronts him with something more, something pertaining to fornication and turns his mind to licentious subjects. And so uh, one thing... Uh, and I've said this before in some of my other videos, but ever since I started reading out loud, I've been uh, noticing how uh, much of a struggle it is to stay present, right? And uh, one time when I was on the Holy Mountain, and I'm very fond of uh, all-night vigils, agripnias, right? And uh, so I asked the elder uh, how he spends so many decades in these all-night vigils and constant prayer, and, at, you know, probably minimum of eight hours of uh, praying per day. I mean, really, it's all day long, but even just the out loud services. And he simply responded by saying, I focus on one word at a time. And so going back to my uh, thought there, when I'm reading and I notice myself stumbling over words, uh, you know, sometimes it's that I don't, you know, it's, a, it's a, a, a word I haven't encountered a lot, and so maybe I'm stumbling over the correct way to pronounce it. And I do uh, 90, probably 7% of these videos in one take. Uh, if I make a mistake early in a reading and I it's like go back a few seconds and start over, sometimes I'll do that. But once I get in, at least halfway through the page, I rarely start over. And so you'll see me stumbling, mispronouncing things, you know, and that's just who I am. But the other thing I'm noticing is how incredibly hard it is to stay present, right, to keep my mind in that present. You know, as I said, the elder said, uh, one word at a time. And when I find myself able to really stay focused on the exact moment um, and I'm focusing one word at a time, my readings for me personally go by a lot smoother and I see every word and I process every word as I come across it. Other times I find myself processing lagging on something I just read and the things that I'm currently reading out loud I start to stumble over and sometimes I have to return and say it again once or twice. And then other times I find myself thinking ahead, oh, okay, you know, as I'm processing something, this is what I might say in the video. 
hopefully for uh, my own edification and for others who may uh, be edified by such words, to the glory of God, of course. Anyhow, so, you know, just uh, the struggle of uh, being present, right? Uh, anyhow, so let's go through this page. It is an excellent thing to teach men that which is good and by constant care to draw away from them delusion and into the knowledge of life. So, of course, it's excellent to help others. Uh, it's what St. Isaac's getting into here, and it's a, it's a high calling, right? And this is the path of Christ and the apostles, so it doesn't get any higher than that. And he goes on to say it is very lofty. But if a man perceives in himself that through a, such a way of life and continual communion with men, his conscience is weakened by seeing external things, his serenity is disturbed, and his knowledge is darkened, since he must still guard his mind, since it's still held in submission, that while he seeks to heal others, he loses his own health, and departing from the chaste freedom of his will, his mind is shaken. Then him, let him remember the apostolic exhortation, which says, Strong food belongeth to them that are more perfect. So again, if we think, uh, maybe prematurely, that we're out here saving others, but we're losing ourselves uh, instead, then we've got to be very careful there. You know, if we're not mature enough, you know, I you know I often think about this with father confessors. They're hearing other people's sins constantly, and so how guarded must their mind be to not let these um, you know these sharing of these sinful moments and these innermost thoughts and action you know deepest secret actions to not be kind of affected by them to say the least not only emotionally and mentally but you know through temptation right. Um, so if we're not careful exposing ourselves to others and putting ourselves in scenarios where we think we're helping others, uh, you know, sometimes we're deluding ourselves uh, because we're really just kind of making excuses and uh, to be put into a, uh, maybe an unhealthy scenario um, or perhaps just how evil's working, right? Uh, we're out there trying to help others, but in so doing, we're losing ourselves. Now, that this last... Um, quotation in the sentence um, is, is, a, is one that I was like really trying to process here. Strong food belongeth to them that are more, more perfect. And so one thing comes to mind is uh, one of my spiritual fathers, my parish priest at one time, he said to me, he said, you know, when our babies are born, you know, we just give them milk, right? And as they start to uh, grow a little bit stronger in body and their their uh, perhaps their organs are getting a little stronger, they're starting the teeth, you know, maybe we'll um, give them some crushed up fruits or vegetables, some baby food, right? And they're able to uh, digest this and it's it's healthy for them. Uh, and, and then as they get older, right, they can start to eat all the things, right? Regular fruit, regular vegetables, maybe even a steak or something like that uh, because their body can handle it. But if we'd given that steak to the infant, it would kill them. But to a grown man, it may offer nourishment and um, some strength, right? So that was one thing that comes up when you hear strong food belonging to them that are more perfect. But again, that's an analogy to, let's say, our spiritual side. And that was why my parish priest had said this to me. You know, when we're infants in our spiritual walk, our journey, when we finally quit hiding ourselves from God and turn back towards God and repent and start to participate in the mysteries and sacraments of the church, if we were giving all uh, the knowledge and spiritual experience all at once, it would probably just fry us, right? We wouldn't be able to digest it and process, and it would probably... Uh, kill us in the infancy of our spiritual uh, maturity, right? But as we begin to grow spiritually and learn and become stronger in, in uh, uh, you know, our fortification to move forward uh, towards salvation, step by step, uh, things are revealed to us and experiences and energies of God um, are given to us and the grace of God you know, not to snuff us out, you know. And so, again, step by step, right? So strong food belongs to them that are more perfect. Of course, using an analogy that we can all understand in the transitory, temporal world, physical uh, world that we're existing in now, but using it as a spiritual analogy, of course. Let him turn back, lest he hear from the Lord the words of the proverb, Physician, heal thyself. So, again, 
you know, let him condemn himself, let him watch over his own good health. Again, it, it's probably better to save your own soul than to go out there thinking that you're saving others, uh, because in so doing, not only might you lose your own soul, but you might be misleading the others, which would be a tragedy. Instead of audible words, let his excellent manner of life serve for edification, and instead of the sounds of his mouth, let his works teach others. And when he keeps his soul healthy, let him profit others and heal them by his own good health. And so um, this one makes me think of parenting, right? We can tell our kids, you know, everything we want till we're blue in the face, but ultimately, more times than not, they're going to lean on our actions, right? They're going to eventually to some degree more or less imitate our actions. So, you know, if we're dropping off our kids on Sunday at church, saying, you know, you have to go to church, you have to go to Sunday school, and then we're running off to McDonald's to grab a coffee and pancakes, and then coming back towards the end to pick them up, what kind of message are we sending to our children, right? That church is just for the young and the old, and that uh, it's not for us. And so, you know, how's that gonna play out in their life, right? It's our example. And as soon as they get to college age and a little bit after that, that's when we're losing our children in the church, right? That's when the biggest drop-off's occurring. So it's good for our children to see us attending services, uh, confessing together as a family when they're young so they, they get that example and they get that habit built at a young age and hopefully they'll consistently keep it, participating in communion after confession, um, having relationships such as... Uh, you know, you know, with a parish priest uh, and or um, a father confessor, maybe creating some relationships with monasteries that are within reach of your family. Uh, these are the examples that we need to be giving our children, um, how a spouses treat each other, right? Uh, you say, oh, you should be nice to girls, and then we scream at our wife, right, or yell at her. That's the example they're leaning on, right? So again, and even beyond our families and parenting, our actions speak louder than words, as they say, right? So instead of audible words, let the excellent manner of life serve for edification. So our example is the greatest teacher. For when he is far from men, he can benefit them even more by the zeal of his good works than by his words, since he himself is sickly and is in greater need of healing than they. So again, this makes me think of, of the ascetics, right? There's uh, ascetics that go off and live in little cells or caves or huts, right? And then we read these stories about these types of saints who then uh, bring so many to Christ and heal so many and become almost famous. But meanwhile, the whole time, they were just trying to get away and work on themselves, right? And so this is when it's St. Isaac, one example of what he's pointing to. Uh, that's in the monastic world. In the lay person world, perhaps, you know, um, instead of getting out there and, you know, on, maybe even in this day and age on social media, you know, spouting every answer to everything, maybe we should be reflecting more and reading and praying and uh, participating in the mysteries of the church and then let God use us as instruments instead of us out there just getting wrapped up in every little uh, social media debate and political debate and all these types of things until we lose a sense of ourselves and just become you know, regurgitation of the the movements of society, right? And my wife says this to me sometimes, you know, oh, you're just going to, you know, tell me every single thing that you read on social media, every stat and everything. We all seen the same thing. And do we know it's even true? And she's right. You know, she's exactly right. You know, instead of just regurgitating the movements of social media or society or the news channels, maybe some more time to reflect and, you know, is our way of like coming back and working on ourselves. You know, we don't have to necessarily be an ascetic living in a desert or cave if we're lay people, right? And and married to our wives instead of to Christ or to sp our spouses. You may be a woman listening. Um, you know, but those quiet moments of reflection and prayer and reading, um, you know, are important too to work, to edify ourselves and heal, you know, to create a better health spiritually and probably, you know, for participating in fasting and these types of things and the mysteries of the church unction and communion and stuff not only our, our spiritual health but our mental of course and our physical health also because god has prescribed the perfect plan for our lives um and here we are all these centuries later trying to uh, uh figure it out on our own and he's already prescribed the best way to live four if the blind lead the blind both shall fall into the ditch so if i'm lost and i'm giving you the directions, then you're certainly going to be lost, and vice versa. 
Again, he reiterates, strong food belongs to those who are healthy, whose senses are exercised, who are able to take every kind of nourishment, that is, the invasion of all the senses, and by reason of their training and perfection, are able to endure every encounter without their heart being harmed. So one thing came to mind is, even as adults, sometimes we get sick or have an injury or battling some kind of disease. And uh, so maybe we were at an age in the 20s and 30s or so forth, teenagers, where we were able to eat that solid, um, you know, bigger food. But now we find ourselves hospitalized and maybe they're bringing us back on IVs and ensure and simple foods to let our uh, body recoup and heal, right? So strong food belongs to those who are healthy, whose senses are exercised and are able to take every kind of nourishment. That is, the invasion of all the senses. Endure every encounter without their harm be harmed. So once, God willing, we reach a uh, state of spiritual maturity where uh, outside things attacking our senses are not so tempting to us. You know, we can squash it at its entrance into our senses. You know, we recognize that it's something that is not healthy and we close the floodgates at that moment and do not allow it to seep from our senses into our mind into our heart you know there's some things we're going to filter out and let be and not recognize and, and say like as we say get behind me satan for when the devil wishes to defile with recollection of fornication a mind that is resplendent with purity he first tests its constancy by the love of vainglory since the inception of this thought has no appearance of passion so, <clears throat> where does fornication and these uh, types of sins come from? From our vainglory, right? Um, and that's what St. Isaac's explaining here. If he wants us to commit fornication or adultery or something like that, he's going to first test us by testing our love of vainglory. And then once he has that vanity, that ego pricked, let's just say, then he can start to introduce uh, these worse um, indulgences. <clears throat> he constantly acts thus with men who guard their mind and in whom he cannot readily introduce an unseemly thought. So again, he keeps pricking at that vainglory, at that ego. Maybe even when we reach a sense of uh, spiritual maturity, now we're proud of it, or we're holier than thou, or we're higher. And then just when this starts to happen, boom. We have these great falls, right? So constantly guarding ourselves, constantly exercising um, spiritually every day through the reading of the saints, through our prayer life, morning prayers, you know, small compline in the evening, you know, making sure that we're getting to church every week and participating in the mysteries and are prepared to participate in those mysteries, constantly allowing God to protect us from these attacks from the wily uh, devil, right? can't do it on our own and this is what God teaches us and that's what he wants us to understand that when we struggle for Christ then Christ has already struggled for us and he meets us at that point right when we're at the point of despair where he's taken us to our limit that's where God picks us up and carries us the rest of the way but when a man departs from his fortress through converse with the first thought and moves away from his refuge the devil immediately confronts him with something pertaining to fornication and turns his mind to licentious objects. So the very moment when we let down our guard, the devil's there to seize that moment. And he's so experienced. I mean, thousands and thousands of years of uh, tempting us as humans. He's uh, become an expert. And we just have this one life, you know, 70, 80 years, uh, if we live a, a full, healthy life. And he has thousands of years, if not multiple thousands of years, tens of thousands of years perhaps, of experience in uh, assisting humans in falling, right? Um, so we need to lean on the saints, the Holy Fathers, on the wisdom of Scripture and what Christ and the Apostles taught us. You know, don't try to figure things out so much on our own, but keep it simple, low profile, focus on what, you know, wiser men than us taught us, and move forward with that backing, right? Anyhow, so excellent page as always. Uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.